This is Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Intuitive Oracle, Jamie Hearn. Jamie stirs the cauldron with witches, shamans, healers, psychics, and mediums who bravely share their power and give you insight into what conversations with dead people really look like. It's probably not what you think. Sometimes hilarious, sometimes macabre, and always informative. Hello and welcome back to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. I'm Jamie Hearn, and today I'm stirring the cauldron with Fred Rutman. Fred was a marketing consultant, then a college business professor teaching finance and marketing until the summer of 2009. Came crashing down on him with a continuous stream of medical traumas, including him being clinically dead 20 times. That's fast. Well, it's traumatic, but fascinating. I can't wait to hear about this. This left him with PTSD, post-concussion syndrome, and ongoing anxiety. The result was being forced into permanent medical leave. Since then, Fred has been hospitalized 22 times and undergone 12 heart procedures with more to come. The short story is his heart was stopping. Each time his heart stopped, he collapsed, hit his head, sustained multiple concussions. That's really a rough cycle to be in. Then eventually figured out he needed a pacemaker, which was great until the infallible pacemaker failed in 2013, requiring two emergency surgeries. And then it failed again with more surgery required and additional complications. It certainly sounds like there's a lot of stuff to dig into here. Um, it, there is still some perpetual anxiety, PTSD, and post-concussion syndrome, but it gets better every day. And I can't wait to hear about how things are continuing to progress with you. Um, Fred does have a really fascinating memoir that is due out probably right around the time that this podcast is airing because we are pre-recording it. Um, It is called The Summer I Died 20 Times. So we'll be sure to include a link where you can find more information on Fred's memoir. In the meantime, let's dig into chatting with Fred. Welcome. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me on. This is a crazy story. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the best. (laughs) Yeah. So I have to say, I love the title of your podcast. Thanks. And uh, some people will some people will ask me, which do you think I am? I'm like, well, aren't we all a little bit of each? Like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're all a lot, little bit of everything. So I'm compelled to hear your experience around that summer. I'm suspect that there's an interesting backstory with your like linear in the box academia background transitioning into this. Pretty rough Being summer. Being repeatedly it dead. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, so, so give us a little bit of the backstory, and then and then dive into that crazy summer where it's where it really started. Well, I was uh, teaching economics when this all started happening, and uh, many people think economics is a death sentence in itself. Uh, Agreed. It's a pretty brutal course. <laughs> Um, so, you know, for the, I don't know, probably the first 14 times, I really didn't know I was dying. It was, you know, I, I, the doctors couldn't figure out anything wrong. They kept trying to tell me I was having a heart attack, but when they would test my blood for the enzymes that show up when you have a heart attack, there weren't any. Ah. So they, um, and I, I forget what they're called because I have a little bit of brain damage. That's um, okay. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, there's that definition of insanity that's attributed to Einstein, like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. 
and that's what was happening with me. The doctors kept trying to force me into a box because, you know, here's a overweight middle-aged white guy who doesn't exercise enough and probably doesn't eat enough. So he must be having a heart attack and hmm. let's not look for anything else. So that's, uh, that's what put me down this rabbit hole. Well, and, that's uh, a whole other conversation in itself, but it's really shitty when that happens and there's legitimately something going on and they're just kind of writing you off. Yeah. And I don't say this to bash the medical system. Um, you know, any system has its positives and negatives. I just happened at the front end of this journey to, to meet a whole bunch of people who didn't know when to uh, move off their spot and try and think outside the box. And that can so. be applied to so many facets of life that, that you're just mm. bringing an illustration to. Yeah. And, you know, the box that they were essentially putting me in was a coffin. So um, I really wish they would have stepped outside that box a little earlier. Right. Yeah. So this was all happening like pretty close to each other, like the events, right? Yes. At the beginning, they were a little spaced out. I don't remember the exact number, but uh, like the first time I noticed it happened to me, I had three events in one night. And I think the second time I had three events in one night and then a few more close together and closer together. And then uh, when I finally ended up in a hospital, I had uh, maybe six within, you know, uh, a three day period. So and what were th even, what were the ev events like? Were wow, um, they come out of the blue and they changed as I went because every time I got a concussion, my brain lost a little bit of function because concussions do that to you. And I was so concussed, I didn't even realize how bad a shape I was in. Um, so. It would start off with what I call a brain quake. And if you've ever seen um, the Wile E. Coyote cartoon where he swallows the earthquake pills <laughs> and he's <laughs> just, you know, uh, you can you can look it up online. Um, but that's what I would feel inside my head. It was like my brain was having an earthquake and then my vision would black out. And this would all happen in less than a second. And then I was out. And then, you know, I would collapse and hit my head on was that ever, whatever was the hardest item in my immediate vicinity, whether it be a manhole cover or a curb or a concrete uh, sink or anything like that, uh, you know, a tile floor in the hospital. And uh, then, you know, there's the coming back to life. So the doctors didn't know why this is happening. They don't know why I have the condition that I have, because it usually doesn't start until people are in their mid-70s or men are in their mid-70s. So um, the coming back to life part was the harder part. Really? Yes. Because... How, how was that? You know, your body's, it's like trying to jumpstart a car in super cold weather. And you essentially have to restart every process in your body. And, you know, for some strange reason, your brain doesn't like that. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging thing. And it felt like I was in the middle of a fireworks display. So I could actually, it was hurting my eyes with all these light explosions and visions I was having, but. So this I is could, in between? Like this is coming back to life. Okay, so this is all happening after you've lost consciousness and fallen and things are shutting down and it's 
so this is what tells you that you're coming back? Well, yeah, I know that now when it was happening to me, I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I could feel like every explosion, you know, it was like I was getting the snot kicked out of me, um, you know, for, and it felt for a long time. I don't know how long it actually was. Right. Um, Cause time doesn't but, exist on that side. Yeah. So it was incredibly painful. And when you wake up, you're just so disoriented and physically drained. It's just an awful, awful experience. I mean, I'm glad it happened, <laughs> but uh, you know, as opposed to the alternative. Great so, perspective, Fred. Yes. <laughs> so do you have any distinct impressions that you can recall from each of the incidents while you were in the in-between? I did have a number of out-of-bodies, um, which are really, really trippy. And I think everybody's experience in this is is very unique. I'm... I'm kind of disappointed that this happened to me so many times and I didn't have any of those, you know, come to the light, come to the other side, we're waiting for you kind of events. And uh, I actually feel kind of ripped off, actually. (laughs) You know, you know, you die once. Okay, you can say I, I didn't have that experience, but like 20 times. Come on. There had to be one in there. So I um the out of body experiences are also very jarring um, because you're, you're looking down on yourself. And, you know, a few times this happened to me outside, like when I was riding a bike, for example, and I was, you know, it was late at night and I was on a bike path in the middle of nowhere. And I remember just looking around and recognizing how alone I was like, I see myself tangled up in my bike, lying in the, off the bike path and being very confused. So if you're a believer in heaven and that, you know, we all have a soul, um, I'm Jewish. So we have a slightly different definition of heaven and what a soul is, but it was literally, I think my soul being so confused, like, do I leave the body? Am I on this schedule? Was I supposed to do this or do I go back in? Like what the hell is. Can we pause for a moment? I'm really interested to hear what the, what your definition of the soul is, because this is a question that we really haven't delved into, but I think it's really fascinating. So tell me what is the, your definition of soul well first i'll give a slight disclaimer is that uh contact your old local orthodox rabbi um because you can probably get a a bunch of different different definitions but it's basically it's your life force like your your body is essentially a series of chemical and electrical functions i mean we have a physicality But something has to direct that, and that is your soul. (coughs) Excuse me. And it has an intelligence, but it needs to work in concert with your body. So when your time is up and your soul is supposed to go wherever it goes, um, there's sort of like a, a cosmic glue that holds them together. And this glue starts to dissipate. And so you see yourself outside your body. But if it's not the right time for you to go, that glue has to be reestablished and, you know, suck you back in. Hmm. I love that illustration. That's like, it's visceral. You you can feel that glue pulling you back in. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's go a step farther and if you could share with us your views and you know they're all formed by so many different factors religious beliefs social beliefs family beliefs but what are your views on heaven um 
I'm sticking with some of the traditional views um, of, you know, Judaism. And a lot of people have, in general, you know, the vision that we're all sitting up on clouds with, you know, white gowns and wings and things like that. I is there, think... Is there a cocktail in that mix? Like... <laughs> Well, probably. Depends on which St. Peter's joke you want. <laughs> I love those St. Peter's at the gate jokes. Um, right. <laughs> you know, uh, if you're, um, there's a f definitely Philadelphia cream cheese up there. because We've all seen those commercials. I had forgotten about those commercials. Yes. <laughs> I, I think there's the, you know, the eternal bliss concept. Um, and then there's a concept that we all get to sit in the heavenly court and uh, God gives lectures. It's the ultimate master class. And all the great wise people of years past are also giving their versions of class. And the more righteous you are, whatever the definition of that is, uh, the better seat you get, like going to a concert. So, you know, if you've been a generally crappy person, um, you know, you'll make it up to the nosebleeds. And <laughs> if you've been a less than crappy person, you know, you might not even make it into the seating area, if at all. So that's sort of, uh, you get sent into an, a class where you learn the secrets of the universe. Fascinating. I love it. Hmm. Hmm, glad. So, I growing up, my best my best childhood friend was Jewish. So mm -hmm. I know um, just enough to be conversant about Judaism, and mm -hmm. I know when to touch the Torah at bat mitzvahs. So mm -hmm. that's, that's about the extent of my knowledge. So thank you for broadening my knowledge base a little bit. My pleasure. It's a, uh, it's a very, Judaism is very complicated. You know, there's a, there's a continuum of observance of people with the Torah. So for those of you that don't know what the Torah is, it's the old Testament before the new Testament was, was amended or appended to it. Right. Before and, it got old. <laughs> yeah. So um, in, in the Torah, there's, 613 distinct commandments on thou shalt do and thou shalt not do's and, uh, and then there's the oral tradition the oral laws that go along with it because you'll find a thing that says like uh keep the sabbath but nowhere in the torah is there a direct explanation of what keeping the sabbath is mm. it's one of the cores so the rabbis had to figure out what keeping the Sabbath is. And they have their rabbinic ways and mysticisms of figuring this stuff out. So it's the uh, same with keeping kosher, the dietary laws. I mean, they're incredibly complex. And <laughs> it's. Yeah, but it's funny how people skew them to their own service. I used to work with a kid. Well, I mean, we were in our 20s, but mm -hmm. his dad was a rabbi and mm -hmm. he was expected to eat kosher. We would go for lunch and he'd say, you want the bacon wrapped scallops, don't you? Mm -hmm. And I say, no, I don't want them. He's like, you want the bacon wrapped scallops? Because if I ordered them and he ate one off my plate, it was OK in his mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There, There's jokes along that. And. You know, the rabbi's walking by a window and he sees this guy in a restaurant eating a ham sandwich. And the rabbi goes in and says, you know, Bob, what are you doing? And Bob says, what's the problem? He says, you're eating a ham sandwich. That's not kosher. He says, you're a rabbi, aren't you? He says, yes. So I'm doing it under rabbinical supervision. Must be okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a so, spinner. <laughs> yeah. People can come up with whatever logic and I know you know Jews from you know whatever end of the spectrum that really want nothing to do with Judaism they don't even want people to know they're Jewish 
to people that are incredibly devout. Um, and usually those people are also the nicest people you'll ever meet. I'm not saying there are no other really nice people you'll ever meet that aren't Jewish. Uh, they just, the people that tend to go with observing the Torah seem to really embrace it and try to be the best person they can be. Maybe more people should do that. Torah or no Torah? Uh, yeah, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? Anyway, let's get back to you, Fred. <laughs> okay. So I think we were were talking about um, the experience of, of the soul reanimating your body after mm -hmm. you'd find yourself in these situations. So... Once you started to come back to life, so to speak, mm -hmm. what was that experience? Pure confusion. Like, mm. why am I lying in a door jam? Why am I lying outside, uh, face first, outside this bus shelter? Why am I waking up in an emergency ward with somebody who looks exactly like Osama bin Laden looking down on me. It's just, it takes a while to get back into reality. The concussions scramble you to, you know, it's almost indescribable and everybody's concussions are different, you know, depending on which parts of your brain get battered and how often you're having them. So it's just so multifactorial. It's almost beyond description. Um, I, even after they figured out what was going on and the doctor ran into the room and said, holy, you know, uh, your heart's stopping and you've been dead. Um, I still couldn't process it. It's actually still hard to process it. You know, right. Cause um, you're like, but I'm here. And there, there was no um, like, huge party when I got there. No, uh, like, I yeah. wasn't all fit. <laughs> yeah. I remember a couple of times I've been in, in the ambulance and the, you know, they hook you up to an ECG and there's that strip that comes out with all the funky lines and it would flatline. And, you know, I'd still be conscious for a little bit. And then the EMTs are like, you know, what the F is going on here? Like you're flatlining and yet you're alert. And then, you know, and then I'm gone. So uh, they didn't know what was going on. It was crazy. So once they kind of got a handle on the bio physical part of what was going on, the biomechanical part, have you had any continuing experiences or, or or things that you would attribute to having died all these times well i think i certainly live a life with a lot more gratitude um if that's what you're asking uh i that's think i've had a couple more out of bodies uh i definitely did when i had a really bad bout of covid interesting mm -hmm. um i had a friend who was in a coma for six or seven months with covid and he told me about you know some of the things he either saw or hallucinated or had a lucid dream i have wild lucid dreams now 100 oh. percent. yeah so i think you know a different part of my brain has been activated from you know, all the work I've done to come back from all the concussions and PTSDs. So for any of our listeners who don't have a full understanding of what a lucid dream is, could you explain that a little bit to us? A lucid dream for me is when you can be active in your dream and you bypass some of the systems of things that you would see in normal life. So in normal life, I'm colorblind. In a lucid dream, I see every color, every color so vividly that 
you know, it's actually painful. But you can change the scenes when you're lucid dreaming. And you have a, a consciousness of what's going on. And you can say, I don't like what's happening here. So, you know, next scene, or I really like what's happening here. And, uh, you know, let's continue what's going on. So, mm. but that's very really fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, none of these things would happen to me in regular life. You know, I've had dreams, lucid dreams, where uh, in the house where I grew up, all of a sudden we were like the NORAD command center uh, in the middle of a war. And we were launching attacks at whoever, you know, we're, the bad guys, you know, launching missiles and planes were taking off from my street and, you know, all sorts of wild things, you know, that is what brings it. that on? No idea. <laughs> you know, It's pretty cool though, to be able to have that experience. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, the, you know, and there's no way to explain them. You know, in biblical times, you could just go to a prophet, right, and say, you know, I had this dream. What does it mean? Oh, your goat's going to die. Okay, thanks. But <laughs> better get a new one. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have things like that at our disposal. I mean, maybe that's part of the exploration that your soul is endeavoring after all of these experiences to really flesh out what some of these things mean. Maybe, maybe uh, my brain thinks I should be a four-star general. I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe you have in another parallel existence somewhere else. Yeah, for sure. Um, I believe in, in reincarnation and, uh, I don't see why we couldn't be. I mean, we're just energy and chemicals. So right. you can just get reconstituted. Stars do it all the time. Galaxies do it. So why can't we? That's a great question. I'm going to have to meditate on that one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like I find... Um, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You know, we've got this new telescope, and I forget what it's called, the the Wells Telescope or something like that, to replace the Hubble. And they can see so far into the universe that they think they're seeing within a billion years of the Big Bang. And they've created a, a technique where they can use other galaxies as magnifying glasses. So they can see what they think is a final point, and then somehow they use that constellation or whatever as a magnifying glass, and they can see another billion years or another billion years, and they can see elements forming. It's pretty phenomenal. It's fascinating and so far beyond my scope of comprehension that I'm just mm -hmm. like, like, wow, <laughs> no words. <laughs> Yeah, when when I read that they're using these other galaxies as magnifying glass, I was like, who thinks of these people? Or, or, who thinks of these concepts? Like, and could anybody have a normal conversation with somebody who's that smart? I have to suspect that there's some involvement of extraterrestrial knowledge or infusion or injection of it somewhere somehow because I mean 150 years ago we didn't have cars and now we're doing this like that's a pretty dramatic leap <laughs> yeah for sure for sure actually well, in my book I have a couple of sections where I write about area 51 oh cool uh, because I I have some conspiracy theories about what happened should have happened to me that didn't happen um with regards to my medical care and things like that so and um, that's a that's a perfect um note to wrap up here on i want to make sure that we share a little information about your book do you have a title to the book yes it's the summer i died 20 times uh it'll be coming out theoretically march 9th 
and it should be available on Amazon and you know the traditional bookstores. And uh, it, I'm very excited. It, it was a a very long, hard adventure writing this book because I had huge gaps in memory from all the concussions and the oxygen deprivation and things of that nature. So you'd be writing something and then like six months later, you'd start to remember something that happened and you'd have to go back and, and rewrite revise. that entire. Yeah. Interesting. Well, mm -hmm. we will make sure to include as much information as we have available at the time that this gets released so people can find you and your book because I am also interested in reading your book. Well, I want you. I want to thank you for joining us today and providing us with a little education and insight in addition to your story. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. If you want to do a round two, I'm up for it. Awesome. Thanks okay. everyone for tuning in. See you next week on Witches, Bitches, and Dead People. Thank you for listening to Witches, Bitches, and Dead People with Jamie Hearn. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in.